Facebook Live. Uh, we're doing a bit of a redo from our Facebook Live on Monday with our child life specialist, Becca Mistos. Um, we had some technical difficulties, so we thought it would be a great opportunity to redo our broadcast because a lot of you seemed to be very interested in the subject matter, which is child life specialists. Um, so with that, we'll get started with Becca. Thank you again for joining us oh and redoing this. Thanks for we really me. appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so what is a child life specialist? What I tell patients and families when I see them is that a child life specialist is kind of like a hospital teacher. So, but instead of um, teaching them about math and reading and science and all the cool stuff they learn at school, we get to teach them about what it's like to come to the hospital and have to be a kid in the hospital. Um, child life specialists mainly use three, three main things kind of drive the work. It's play, preparation, and assessment. And that is, uh, you know, big umbrellas that fall under all of those things, but um, yeah, so play preparation and assessment is how we um, help our families cope with all sorts of different hospitalizations and medical experiences and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And schooling for child life specialists, yeah. did you major in child life special? Yeah, so I yes. graduated from the University of Iowa and at the time there wasn't an exact child life major, so I'm going to talk about what it's like now. So I did okay. major um, in something similar and then I was able to get an internship through Iowa's program and then go on to sit for the exam and get my certification. But the National Council has changed it so that by 2020, it'll be a master's level degree in order to even apply or become a certified child life specialist. Um, so like the University of Iowa now has a five-year program that's three years of undergrad and two years of a master's program. Um, so it's one less year of school, but with a master's level degree. Um, and then you're able to go and uh, apply for an internship and sit for the exam. But there's also great programs like a school here in Chicago, Erickson Institute, mm -hmm. has a two-year master's level program. So if you already are done with your undergrad and wanted to go into child life, that's a really good option for them too. You mentioned internship. Is that something that is required of new grads, mm -hmm. even with a master's? Yeah. Yep. So internships are um, only available to people based who are in a child life track. So there's all these different classes that you have to take in order to qualify for an internship, mm -hmm. including one taught by a child life specialist. Um, so an internship is something you would apply for after a certain amount of schooling. And the internship is just like a residency, mm -hmm. so you follow somebody who's in the field in various rotations. Um, there's different projects that, you know, and school work that comes along with it. And then having an internship completed has, um, gives you the ability to sit for the exam the same way that nurses and social workers and everybody else sit for an exam. And then once you pass the exam, you are a certified child life specialist. Okay. Um, and so where are child life specialists found in the hospital? Yeah, so we have every we have them on almost every floor of the main building. Okay. Um, we also have people out at Clark and Deming, the um, satellite location of Lurie, as well as Westchester. Okay. And in our emergency department. I think. Uh, yep, so emergency department, um, both floors of surgery is me, um, and then there's the neonatal intensive care unit, um, the pediatric intensive care unit, the cardiac unit, outpatient, and inpatient hematology and oncology, um, the neurology floor, the epilepsy unit, the pulmonary floor, the general surge floor, um, so pretty much everywhere. And then, like I said, the satellite locations too. Are they only found in children's hospitals? Mainly at this moment, that's a, that's a popular place to find mm -hmm. child, child life specialists, excuse uh -huh. me, but there are um, private practices that have child life specialists. Mm -hmm. There are child life specialists I know expanding into the field of like dentist's office and um, children of adult patients is becoming a more and more popular thing to have. Um, I think every hospital should have a child yeah. special, a group of them at least, um, but the field has only been around for 50 years or so, so as people start to realize the value, hopefully it'll become more and more popular. And so what services do you provide uh, yeah. the child, but also the family? Yeah, absolutely. So um, being a child life specialist means that when the patient is a child, the patient is also a family, exactly like you said. So. Mm -hmm. A lot of our work goes into not just preparing and supporting the patient, but the families as well. Mm -hmm. So when they come in for everything from stitches in a, or a broken arm to a diagnosis of a terminal illness, um, our job is to go in and use our developmentally or our developmental knowledge to assess the situation and kind of figure out how best to support the patient and the family. A lot of times that means we're teaching all about what goes into a diagnosis or a procedure with developmentally appropriate language. Mm -hmm. um, we're figuring out, you know, where our anxiety and our fear is within those situations, and how we can help gain, help them gain control over it, so that they're not as fearful, but they have more understanding, and so they're better equipped to cope, not just for that short-term period, but for the longer term as well. Um, I think that 
it's really common for when kids are going through, when anybody's going through um, a medical experience, it's easy for their brothers and sisters and cousins mm -hmm. and all that to get kind of swept up in the madness. Mm -hmm. um, so we really make an effort to make sure that they feel educated and supported and included and empowering parents and caregivers with resources to take home so that they know, you know, if, if things start to progress, what are concerning behaviors to look for at home and not just for the patient, but the siblings as well, and then helping them kind of navigate that when they aren't in the hospital. So. And so you work in the surgical services department, mm -hmm. which um, you help kids when they come in for surgery and mm -hmm. as also post-surgery. Correct. But can you give us a, a little rundown of a typical day for you? Yeah. If there is a typical day. Yeah. There isn't really a typical day, which is what I love about mm -hmm. my job. Um, but so when kids come in for all different kinds of surgeries, um, we a typical interaction would be um, if I saw them or if a nurse noticed they were relatively nervous on mm -hmm. the way in, or if a family had called beforehand and just said, I think my son, you know, is really nervous. Um, what do we do? How do we help them navigate that? I go in and introduce myself and kind of say my job is to make this as easy for everybody as possible. And sometimes that means, a lot of times that means we show pictures of the operating room, we talk about what the monitors do, why we wear the monitors, what the mask looks like, what the mask does. We answer questions about why we're having surgery and we can kind of navigate that. It's a pretty common thing to have parents um, be hesitant or nervous to talk about surgery with their child just because they don't want to um, say too much or not enough uh -huh. or um, you know, make the child more fearful. Mm -hmm. But kids do incredible with the appropriate language and honesty. Honesty is huge, so we really advocate for developmentally appropriate preparation as much as we can um, and that parents feel comfortable and that's kind of our job to help them feel comfortable. So we talk about like why our tonsils have to come out or why uh, you know why we have to go to sleep so that we can check our nose or look at our bellies or things like that. Um, and then one of the hardest parts about, one of the most stressful parts of a surgery day is when the child has to separate from mom and dad because we separate from a room like this mm -hmm. to go back to the operating room. And so that's my job too. So by way of preparing a patient for their surgery and talking about what happens, I'm able to build a little bit of a rapport, establish some trust between us. Um, and then I say to them, so what do you think about if you and I go together and we can blow some bubbles down the hallway and then I'll be there when we put the mask on and then I get to come out and tell mom and dad how great you did. Not only does that build trust within the patient with, a med with someone who wears a badge, but it also helps mom and dad know that you know, we're through that first, that first hurdle of getting them off to sleep and knowing that they did okay. Um, and, that, and I always say the next thing you know is that they'll be waking up and they'll be back with mom and dad. So, um, and then post-op care um, is a lot of you know, reminding patients, you know, this was, what, didn't this go by so fast? You did such a great job reinforcing the positive behaviors mm -hmm. and then helping with going home. So pain management, medicine taking, if they wake up with something in or on their body that they didn't wake up with before, a lot of education goes into that piece. Um, and that is, um, I do a lot of partnership work with the people that work on the inpatient floors, the child specialists that work on the inpatient floors too. Okay. So. Well, we'll take a viewer question right now. Um, what time do you guys start? <laughs> Where were there early? We're there early all the time for biopsies, and I'd love to request a specialist this time. So that's a great question. Yeah. Is there someone always here to help mm -hmm. in child life? And also, how does a parent or a guardian request the services of a child yeah, life specialist? Yeah, sure. So there is a child life specialist in the building between the hours of 6.30 in the morning through like 1-ish mm -hmm. in the morning. So there's just that stretch of like 2 to 6-ish, and hopefully they don't have procedures at 6 a.m. Uh -huh. um, they may have to arrive, but the procedure wouldn't be scheduled till 7.30. Um, I am the only one in the building at 6.30 and then we start to accrue more like 7.45, 8 o'clock. But if we're coming in for procedures, I'm the one in surgery, so hi, that's me. You can email me or let your scheduler nurse know that um, you'd like to be seen by a child life specialist. Um, that's a, and then that's a general way too, that if you know that you're coming in for a procedure, you can let the scheduling nurse know and they can put you in touch with us. Um, you can always look us up online. There's a various um, phone numbers and emails, um, but the child life um, referral line we call it's kind of like the house line um, we can post that right yeah with we'll the, post that in the comment section after the broadcast and then from there you would kind of get dispatched to the person that um, would be the so like you would come to me for surgery uh -huh. or you know Sarah for inpatient hematology and oncology things like that so um, you mentioned that a parent can request it and then you'll also kind of look at the census that day yeah. prior to surgeries and see maybe what kid could yeah. benefit from the service and then how do you guys work with 
the clinicians, like the nurses, physicians, yeah, um, communication wise? So they, um, a lot of a really important skill that child life specialists develop is triaging. So kind of figuring out, you know, the higher not hierarchy of needs, but kind of what's the most pressing need at the time and how mm -hmm. do we manage that. I am the only one in surgery, so <laughs> it's, that's a skill that I've developed quite a bit to kind of figure out where we need to be um, and provide as much service to as many families as possible. But I'm so lucky to work with some of the best, in my opinion, um, nurses and anesthesiologists and surgeons and other staff members um, that are really good about helping me do that. And that's, a, that's one of the main ways that we get referred is by the incredible nursing staff and residents mm -hmm. and doctors that we have up on the inpatient floors as well that are like, hey, he seems to be really quiet, or he was tearful when he came in, or we're really struggling to get through this therapy. Um, we do a lot of referral-based work, so we depend a lot on our medical team, the way that they depend on us mm -hmm. to help navigate, not just like taking the medicine, but the whole healthcare experience, um, you know, the entirety of it. So, and we sit in like an inpatient floor as we sit in on the rounds um, right. that everybody else does, and we participate in the medical care, but then we're also, part of the children's services team, so that includes social work and pastoral care and mm -hmm. music therapy and art therapy, and then our activity coordinators up in the Family Life Center, our big playroom on the 12th right. floor that we're so lucky to have. Um, so it's a lot of multidisciplinary interaction amongst staff members, not just medically based, but psychosocially based, and how do we make them, you know, how do we help them continue to be kids and continue to be self, be themselves while they're here and hit those developmental mi milestones and also do, um, the stuff that they enjoy, like art and movies, and being a kid, stuff. being a kid, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a really big collaborative effort. I know, absolutely. Like, um, the inpatient child life specialists meet with like the directors of those floors. There's yep. constant communication constant, that's happening yeah. to help. Yeah, and I think like one of the you know one of the things that's most important in child life is figuring out you know how do we incorporate play, not just normalization play and making the environment less threatening, but play that teaches us about our medical care and play that helps us cope and helps the adults in the medical world learn what the kid is thinking and child life specialists are trained to kind of interpret that. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know that it's happening without the watchful expertise of the other medical staff members. So, And what's important to note too is um, a need program is our residents yeah. get to shadow mm -hmm. child life specialists through a development and behavioral rotation. Mm -hmm. um, and residents are our physicians in training. Correct. Um, so Talk about the benefit of that. Yeah, so that's a really nice way for us to um, get FaceTime with medical care people who see our patients and families who may have not seen a child life specialist before. Mm -hmm. So we, me and one of the other child life specialists, Amanda, we sit with them for like an hour, like once a month. This group changes regularly. Um, but we have a PowerPoint presentation that talks about the different developmental ages. So infants, toddlers, school age, adolescents, and we kind of talk about the things that we're looking for. Uh -huh. um, and so it gives us an opportunity to say, so if you and I go into a room together, here's what I'm assessing. And we kind of get to learn what they're looking for too, but hopefully we're conveying that what, by conveying what we're assessing for, that'll help trigger things. So like if we feel, you know, if we walk into a room and somebody's eyes are downcast and they're not interacting, that would be a reason to call child like, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I noticed that he wasn't really participating or he seems like he's, you know, he's wetting the bed again or these regressive things that, you know, sometimes toddlers and school agers have. Um, but so, and then they get to come shadow us and see what we do for a day. And it's, I it's love awesome. to get yeah. to shadow, you know, see what people, different people do um, in a hospital and kind of get a feel for, you know, how we all fit as pieces of a puzzle. I feel like it only benefits everyone's Both of us, yeah. yeah. And then there have been so many times that I've had residents um, come and shadow me and then I end up running into them again. Uh -huh. So it's a face-to-face -face, like, oh my god, I remember and you. They and they know help. you now. And yeah, 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 and helping them understand how they can contact us and how we're available and, um, yeah, so. Well, we have some questions from our viewers. As a reminder, you can submit your questions in the comments. Um, what do you mean by developmentally appropriate language? Yeah. What's the difference between the way the doctor explains things and the way you explain things? That's a really good That's question. That's a really good question. So, um, Developmentally appropriate language is the terminology that we use considerate of what children understand at various points in their life. Mm -hmm. So an example I'll give is um, if a kid comes in for surgery and they are like let's say around the age of three, mm -hmm. that tells me that if they're a younger three, like they just turned three versus you know closer to four, that developmental age is really when they start to understand cause and effect and step by step. And so the way that you would 
speak to a three-year-old versus a five-year-old is very different because they understand differently. Mm -hmm. um, so being considerate of how we prepare children for what's coming based on where they're at developmentally. And that doesn't just, that's not just for typically developing patients, but also for kids who are on the autism spectrum or who have Down syndrome or who mm -hmm. are developmentally delayed or have sensory needs. So being mindful of where we're at chronologically, so how old we are, but also where our minds are at and how mm -hmm. we understand and interact with the world around us. So like a lot of times, you know, if kids, come, little ones come in for surgery, like two, three, they're not going to understand if I pull out a picture of a room we go to and then we talk about this and then this and then this. But I can simply say, in a little while, you and me are going to go together and we're going to wear a mask uh -huh. and we go to sleep and we wake up, mom and dad come back. So very oversimplified, whereas a six or seven year old we could give much more detail to. Um, but like I said, so we're trained in the, the verbiage that we use and a lot of things that we use colloquial, colloquially, um, but also in medical care, like the ICU or a CAT scan or thing or a blood draw, like kids hear I, literally ICU or a CAT scan, they think of something that meows uh -huh. or a blood draw, they think of crayons and, you know, colored pencils and whatever else they use to draw. So helping them clarify and using words that um, instead of cut, we use small opening instead of um, you know, burning, we clarify, is it itchy, is it irritating, you know, what is it going to feel like? So not only is it teaching them about what's happening, but we use that kind of stuff to help them manage expectations about what it's going to feel like, how mm -hmm. long it'll feel like that, and when we go back to feeling like ourselves. So not even, so language varies from age to age, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, but what about the services a child life specialist would provide, say, a NICU sure. infant compared to one of our teens on an inpatient Yeah, board. obviously very different. And I think that's a common misconception of child life is that we can't, if we can't talk to them, we can't serve them. Mm -hmm. And that's not true at all. Um, NICU child life specialists are magical people. They, um, they do a lot of things, you know, not just NICU, but infants, people that work with infants, uh -huh. um, the child life specialists that see infants a lot. We do Dr. Harvey Karp's five S's, so it's um, these very, this combination of shushing and swaddling and sidelining and sucking, and you know you can look that up. It's really interesting. Um, but normalization and calming mechanisms that help a baby cope with the sensory stimuli around them, um, and then we also do you know a few of our child specialists are infant massage certified, which is huge because mm -hmm. a lot of times babies that are in the NICU um, can't be held by their parents, which would be really really hard mm -hmm. um so we, we use infant massage to not only help parents n learn how to calm their child when they can't pick them up mm -hmm. but also communicate with their child so you know tight fists and turning away and various things that babies do um helping them understand what their baby is telling them and then how they as caregivers can help manage the stressful experience of being in the hospital um and infants too and a lot of you know a lot of times when you can't speak to them it goes back to environmental stimuli and soothing things like turning the lights down, putting soft music on, limiting the people in and out of the room as we are able to, um, but also helping parents and families and big brothers and big sisters and family members help you know understand kind of what's going on and yeah. supporting them because I think that's just another point to reiterate is that it's not just for the child who is yeah. a patient. It's for family members and siblings who really yeah. can benefit from the services that well, you provide. I think, yeah, and I think too, one of the big things, especially in the winter time, is our flu restriction. Um, so we have mm -hmm. flu restriction because it, you know, cuts our infection potential down quite a bit. But it's also so hard to keep patients and fam patients away from their right. families. And you know, the cutoff is 12 years and older for siblings. So when we have big brothers and sisters who can't be at the bedside, we help them understand why that is, and then mm -hmm. we get creative and. Know, can we help you draw pictures so you can decorate your brother's room? Can we, you know, FaceTime, you know, using technology yeah. to our advantage, um, but helping keep that family connected, not just for the sake of the patient, but their brothers and sisters too. We have um, more questions. Uh, do we have child life specialists available at Westchester? We do. Her name is Lori Esch. She's okay. wonderful. And so a parent visiting Westchester would just, when they yes. arrive for their appointment, request the services mm -hmm. of Lori. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there was another question earlier on. This is more of a personal question for you. Okay. What made you want to go into child life? Like, how did you even learn about the profession? Yeah, um, I was everything under the sun in college. <laughs> I was <laughs> anesthesia, I, ironically enough. I was nursing, and then I was maybe education, and then I was PR for like five minutes. And mm -hmm. then um, the University of Iowa was where I went, and they had um, 
one of the more established dance marathon programs. Okay. So Dance Marathon is a at Iowa and all over the country is a children's miracle network thing. Um, and it's a at Iowa it's a 24 hour no sitting no sleeping no drinking caffeine dance marathon. I did it for all four years. It was the best experience. Um, but through volunteering at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics, I learned what child life was and. Mm. I admittedly was intimidated by the small number. They only take 10 students at oh, Iowa, wow. so I was really intimidated by that. But then October of my junior year, I shadowed a child life specialist, and that was, I just knew that that was what I wanted to do, and I kind of never looked back. I was able to get the classes done, and I was admitted to Iowa's program, and then the rest, the rest is history. history. Yeah. And we're glad that yeah. you did change and majors I, so often. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it just, I think that that's really important too, so for new grads, I, I just didn't, I was sitting in all these different classes and I just felt like I, I could do the content, I could study okay. and I could memorize. I just like didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And then I got into child life classes and it wasn't work and it wasn't studying. It was so interesting and so like I just wanted more and more and more and I encourage. That's a good indication that you're choosing the right thing. Yeah, I encourage college kids to try and go out and find that. And if you're a child life student that's looking into, you know, going into child life or you know you're going to major in that, some advice I would give would be. Um, this was a question we got yeah. the last time. Mm -hmm. The more diverse volunteer experience you can get, the better you stand out on paper. Okay. So, you know, different groups of kids, different cultures, different backgrounds, different countries, you know, however you can get diverse experience, um, the more you stand out on paper. And not just the more you stand out on paper, because it's not just about resumes, but that builds um, into your repertoire of experiences. And there are things I'm pulling from every single day from the different experiences I had and things that you know, you never know are going to come back mm -hmm. to be helpful to you, but, um, you know, all you can do is build into that repertoire and um, improve your understanding of different developmental levels and diagnoses and all that kind of stuff. So, Another question. How do you help children who had had a traumatic past experience with hospitals or lab draws deal with upcoming procedures? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that we, if we have the time in an ideal world, we like to try and figure out what's at the root of the trauma mm -hmm. so what was it about the last time you came in that was so scary was it you know having were a lot of people in the room or people sitting over you was it too loud was it hurting you know to try and figure out where the source of the majority of that trauma comes from and then help them work through that um, we help provide appropriate choices so here's what you can do but here's what we you know here's the choices that you aren't allowed to make and here's why um, and then we do our best to try and ameliorate the situation for the next time we come in. Um, our goal is to get to the root of that anxiety and help them master and get better control of their anxiety or their fear, which then in terms not in turn not only educates them but promotes their cooperation and their compliance because they feel like you know their perceived control is increased. Mm -hmm. We involve families as much as we can, um, but we just want to help them master these experiences and. Um, we want to be able to build trust in medical staff, not just child life, not just nurses, not just doctors, but everybody, that we're here to help them, not to hurt them mm -hmm. for the duration of their life, really. And something I wanted to add, we know I added it last time, but crying is okay. Crying is a completely developmentally appropriate, normal way to express fear and concern. Mm -hmm. But um, like one thing I look for in surgery is if a kid is, you know, they're crying, but they're still cooperating and they're still doing what they're, I'm asking them, you know, we're asking of mm -hmm. them that's a really excellent sign of positive coping. You're allowed to cry, you're allowed to be sad. I, adults cry when they go to <laughs> surgery, so it's totally fine. Um, but if they're able to cooperate and um, remain calm and you know, just giving them a chance to, or building trust in us, and, and then I, that's why I go back and reinforce, like just like I told you, remember, it was so fast, uh -huh. mom and dad came back. Um, so yeah, helping, back to your question, helping them navigate that anxiety and that um, get better control of what's going on and helping to manage it from there and make those experiences better and better each time and um, help them play a role in it, give parents control. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different stuff we can do to help make that easier. So let's talk about the pre-surgery yep. program that our child life pro specialists offer. Yeah. Um, and then we'll get into some of the actual techniques that you <laughs> yeah. use to help kids prepare for surgery. The tour, right? Yeah, the tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at this time, our tour program has shifted a few, uh, quite a bit over the last year or so. Um, at this time, we offer pre-surgery tours the first Saturday of each month, mm -hmm. uh, hosted by or run by a child life specialist. Her name is Stephanie. She's wonderful. Um, and so she does two different sets of tours, one for a general surgery tour and then one specifically for spinal fusion patients because the post-op care is pretty intense for mm -hmm. those surgeries. 
Um, so we run those tours um, the various times. You can always email childlife at lurychildrens.org or let your nursing staff know if you're interested in a pre-surgery tour. Um, and they come and you get to see kind of the area. We see a pre-op room. We, we don't go back to the this OR. This is a pre-op room, yeah. just so um, everyone knows. This we is don't, what, sorry. No, this is the room that a child would be with, in before with they're a bed. <laughs> with a bed. We've yeah. taken the bed out for this purpose, but... Um, yeah. yeah, so they, we don't go back to the OR just because it's stale back there, but we do so, show pictures. Mm -hmm. And so that's a grounding experience, not just for the child, but also for the parents as well. So they can kind of picture what the waiting room looks like, where we're going to be while our mm -hmm. kids in surgery, kind of what to expect. Um, Definitely then, alleviates stress, even just the day of coming in, checking in, finding your way. This is a huge hospital. So. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and giving them kind of like, okay, here's where, you know, this room is where this happens, this room is where this happens, and then I go back the day of and kind of reinforce, make sure we don't have more questions, and it's just another way to support our patients and families. Yeah, Ideally, awesome. we would we would love to run those tours, you know, twice or three times a week, but just limited on staff. So can't provide that at the moment, but um, yeah, so I encourage people to check and that so them out. To inquire about those tours, it's childlife at lurychildrens.org. Mm -hmm. Someone would email or, yeah, that or just getting scheduled for surgery, just, just mention know. It. Okay. If you're interested in speaking with a child life specialist, a lot of the surgery schedulers know to, that I'm the surgery child okay. life specialist. Yeah, and I can put you in touch with Stephanie. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, another question What tools go into a child life specialist's toolbox? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, this is from someone who knows you, apparently. So. Okay. <laughs> Toolbox, so an actual tool, like physical items that go into my toolbox. Maybe they're talking are about these things. Bubbles, bubbles, light spinners, so things that light up. Um, sensory equipment, so like glitter ones uh -huh. and pinwheels, and bubbles are huge. And Play Doh is my favorite toy. And Legos too, Legos are pretty great, but Play Doh. Um, and then, so things that promote play but also can help us um, de stress, like squeezing Play Doh and blowing bubbles, deep breaths. If we're talking about like characteristics, I don't know if that was oh, the no, question. I think it's no, I think like actual yeah. tools. Okay, so yeah, um, iPads are great. iPads are a great distraction uh -huh. tool. They're not the end all be all, and we're also mindful of the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations about screen time. Uh -huh. um, so we do use iPads for distraction, and it's nice if you know if we can't use our hands or if we need something visual to you know keep our head turned, we use that. And we I use my iPad for teaching purposes, so that's where I keep my pictures, so I can show the same pictures to each kid. Um, so yeah, Before we get into all this, <laughs> um, all of the fun stuff here, or it looks like fun, yeah. um, it serves a very important purpose, I know that. But let's talk about medical play before um, we do bubbles. Yeah, so medical play is one of the most important things that, well, one of the biggest things, but not mm -hmm. most important, we're all important. Um, one of the biggest things that Child Life does, um, they you take medical equipment and use it in guided and non-guided play sessions to help familiarize it, mm -hmm. um, to make it less threatening, to give kids more control, to help them understand. And it even goes so far as to, you know, incorporate f protected, you know, supervised needle play sometimes. So kids that, you know, have to go home and they're going to have weekly injections, mm -hmm. we give them a chance to see it, to touch it, to talk about it, so that it practice. Kind yeah, of so it's not this like scary, terrible thing that we aren't allowed to touch and it's only painful. And you know, promoting their control and their understanding of what it's used for. For surgery, um, one of the scariest things that kids talk about is having to wear the mask, because it, when we wear it, we're lying down, mm -hmm. and it's a vulnerable position, and it has to go over our nose and mouth, and sometimes it smells funny. You can't pick a flavor. We have strawberry, cherry, bubble gum, or orange to choose from. Mm -hmm. But if kids have a particularly intense mask aversion, I usually show them this. So we take a mask. This is what the oxygen masks look like for anesthesia. Mm -hmm. You are a master. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so we so. take something that kids know, bubbles, uh -huh. and we use medical equipment for it. And not only is it ridiculous looking, and it makes it really fun. But it's teaching an important technique. Too. Yep. So it's exactly what we ask them to do when we put the mask on in the operating room. You know, we're going to put it over your nose and mouth. Uh -huh. You get to pick the smell. And then all we have to do is pretend like you're blowing bubbles. Um, so it... And it you know, a Somebody lot of times can relate to. Yeah, a lot of times kids go from being terrified to put the mask on and even look at it, and then we're touching and playing and putting it on mom and putting it on dad, and mm -hmm. that's the way that. And parents get to see it too, so they know that it's exactly we're not oh, wow. lying about it smelling like strawberries. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's one way that we do it. And then these other tools, quickly. Yeah. I know we're at thirty minutes, and we don't um, want to take too much of your time. No, that's all right. So, like I was talking about earlier, one of the biggest points of separation one of the biggest areas of stress is that separation. 
And so instead of conveying it to kids as this like, okay, goodbye, we'll see you later, like a big, you know, separation and like final piece of it, mm-hmm. we say, you know, hey, mom and dad are going to go get you some popsicles and juice. What if we, what if I get you a magic wand so it's just these glitter wands and we blow bubbles all the way down the hall to the operating room and kids see how many they can pop. So they're engaged in play. It's a game that we get to play. We put, it's a game we put into an environment that doesn't really lend itself to play. And not only is the kid calm and more cooperative and we're still establishing that trust, Mm -hmm. but then parents get to see their kid calm and relax. And then I come out five minutes later and tell them that they did an awesome job and they were totally brave and I usually get oh they didn't cry and it's like no Which they, is just they knew a exactly what completely what. huge peace of mind yeah 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 absolutely and you know facil- facilitating play not just for typically developing kids but environmentally for kids who have those sensory needs so you know that we have these tubes that vibrate and that sensory stimuli is what a lot of those kids are seeking so mm-hmm. incorporating that into going back to the operating room or waking up with it or wearing a heavy lap pad while we go to sleep or something that lights up that we can kind of hold in our hand and, you know, a comfort thing, too, mm-hmm. for kids of all different kinds of development and, and that, all that. this wand lights up. It's probably very it. nice for distractions, too, during Yeah, and little ones, and, you know, and gross and fine motor skills is another thing child life specialists are looking at, and being able to press a button and we'll watch it light up, and we play with bubbles, but also for little ones who are hungry because they have to keep bellies empty before mm-hmm. surgery, lights and spinners Occupied. are a good thing. Oh. Yeah. Well, I think if we don't have any more viewer questions, we'll end yeah, our broadcast. Great. Thank you so much, Becca, for redoing this, yeah, and no we hope our viewers appreciate it as well, and we answered your yeah, questions. Yeah. Um, just as a reminder, our child life specialists here at Lurie Children's are largely funded by philanthropy. That means by donors, so um, if you'd like to donate to the child life specialist program here at Lurie Children's, you can do so by visiting lurichildrens.org. Thank you.